Those of us who, who go to this church uh, are going to know this song. But I was, this one was going through my head today, and I was thinking, you know what, Lord, it's, it's so true. It's funny. So, <clears throat> right, let's pray first. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this evening, God. We just ask, Lord, right now that you would just come. Um, just uh, uh, that your spirit would be here, Lord God, and that you would just uh, bless everything, Lord God, that we say and that we sing, Lord God, and everything, Lord, that is done, let it be for your glory. We thank you in your holy name we pray this Jesus. Amen. Amen. You guys might remember this one. This is, uh, you guys, well, we, we sang this one quite a bit, actually. When you got faith, the mountain moves. Amen. The troubles of life are like a bell. Where's the armor down? And sometimes the struggle is relentless. You cannot be straight from the ground. In the midst of our weakness, God is. Put your trust in the Lord and He will lead you on. Because when you have faith, the mountain will move. And when you believe, the Spirit is renewed. The darkness is broken. In the Savior's name, reach the sky, hope will arrive, hold on to faith. Take the again. When you have faith, the mountain will move. When you believe,
Lord. That is true, man. We're going through a lot of troubles and things are right now where there's uncertainty and there's difficulties, but you know what? When you have faith, that mountain will move. So if you have a, a mountain in your life, you know, and there's something that is just like, man, this is just really, really tough. You know, know this, man, that God is a God of the impossible and he will move that mountain if you believe in faith. Amen. Before we get started, does anyone have a testimony, anything they'd like to share of what God has done for them or what God is doing in your life wherever this week? Anyone? 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 I had a visitor this week. You did? Yes. Cool. I flew down my chimney. That is an interesting visitor. <laughs> I was scratching inside my ch chimney in my wood stove. And I thought, how do I get rid of this? And this this is the time of year that bats would come into my house. I, oh, wow. Well, yeah. That's, that's never good. And um, so I I was led to look up on the internet. How long can a bat last without food or water? <laughs> it's 24 hours. Wow. And you know what happened in 24 hours? The bat stopped scratching. <laughs> <laughs> so now I can open the flu, and uh, but I'm not going to do it right now. Remove the bat with a pair of gloves, yeah. just in case it has one last ounce of strength to yeah. bite. <laughs> so just oh okay, yeah, well it's good. You could be thankful for that. Yeah, yeah, amen. The other visitor I had was my brother, ah, <laughs> who was not like a bat. <laughs> <laughs> He lasted longer than 24 hours. Oh, good. Yeah, so he's just going to be about three blocks from the church. Wow, praise the Lord. So he found a house. Nice. Found a house. Good, great. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, praise God. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, I'm going to grab some there. Okay. All right, well. Uh, we're going to go ahead and then we're going to uh, dive into uh, this and experiencing God. So if uh, those who are joining us online, wow, this is uh, experiencing God. And I believe, let me just quick check here, but I believe it's, it's not chapter six, it might be seven, or if not that, it's part two of six. And that is my third. All right. So there's some really great stuff we're gonna go over today. And uh, so in Experiencing God, yes, this is uh, chapter six, part two. So today we're going to talk about um, the equipping. Um, as we know, God is at work. And so we're gonna talk about the equipping of God and that is um, through the, the Holy Spirit. So before we get started, let's just go ahead and ask the Lord to anoint his word as we pray. Okay. Thank you, Lord God. We just ask you, Lord Jesus, that you will just uh, anoint this time, Lord God. We thank you for your word. God, your word is life. Your word is truth. We ask, Lord, that you open our eyes so that we see that truth that's in your word. Open our ears to, so we hear what you are saying to us. And open our hearts so that we can imply that wisdom and instruction of your word to our lives. We thank you, God. We love your word. We cherish your word. And now, Lord God, as we sit at your feet, Lord Jesus, we ask that you would teach us so that we can be better people, Lord God, and also, Lord, be better equipped for the ministry and for doing your will. And all these things we ask, Lord God, we pray that you'll be glorified in everything, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the, uh, the Holy Spirit today and about... Uh, you know, being being equipped, and so the interesting thing is, is um, in in his book, um, Henry Blackby, in his book, he talks about this one lady that was in his church when he was doing ministry at the time in Canada, and what he would do is he would send her out to the hospitals, visitation, and things like that, because he figured it's it's a good church thing to do. So while she would go out and visit and do these visitations and stuff like that, well, the pastor was getting calls. The following uh, the next day about like how people were really distraught and it just it wasn't working out well at all and and how you know she made people feel worse rather than better even though her intentions were really good 
And so the pastor decided, well, you know what? He would have observed this for himself. And when he did, he listened to her. She went to the hospital and she talked to someone that had uh, a condition um, on why they were in the hospital. And she would always describe either one of her friends who had the same disease and then died, or, or if not that, uh, about, you know, it was okay at first, but then it was symptoms of something much worse. And then, you know, she got even sicker yet, and then all the trouble, the problems that went with it. And so uh, he was, <laughs> the pastor was on this, and he's like, yeah, I don't think this is going to work out, you know? And so I, I think we definitely need to uh, 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 make, a, make a change. And if I may, I'm going to do a little sidebar here for a moment, just letting everyone know that, um, that the reason why uh, Pastor John is not here tonight is because he is uh, a teaching uh, class in the Philippines. He is a uh, Bible school instructor. So yeah, that's what he's doing. And uh, school has started up again. And so yeah, otherwise he would be here with us. So yeah, real excited about that. He does that on Monday and Wednesday too, I believe. So that's cool. So anyway, uh, that being said, just wondering out know, there's some people that are new and just wondering, hey, where is Pastor John Kelman? That's where he is. He's actually in his office. He's very close to us right now. Not in All right. Yeah, he's not in his office. He's, he's, he's not in any of but he's in his office right now. All right. So, yeah. So, they're, they're doing exciting things there. So, when the pastor uh, in, in, this, in this book and uh, looks at all these things, he's like, you know, she's got a real heart and she wants to do this, but is she really equipped and able to do it? And then he talked to her and, and she didn't really see that it was a problem. She was just being honest. And so the, the pastor spoke to her and said, you know, I noticed one thing that you do have. You have a really great strength. And what you're good at is intercessory prayer. Now, I noticed that, you know, you pray and, and, and God answers your, your prayers. And, you know, you, you're pretty intense about praying. So he decided that what he would do is he would have her use her gifts that, that she has in, in the church by doing intercessory prayer. And then so she started to pray. She asked pastor as, as, as time went on, she got this uh, real, you know, uh, urge and stuff to, to pray and it was this hunger she had. So she said, give me a list of like people who uh, we wanna see get saved and, and, you know, in our church and so forth. So the pastor did. And as time went on and she started praying, he noticed that these divine appointments started happening and little by little, you know, these names were getting checked off the list and all the people that she was praying for. And then she would get a peace and a comfort in her heart. And then so she would call pastor and she'd say, so-and-so, you know, I really believe, you know, they need to give their life, you know, to Christ. And then pastor would say, yeah, that actually happened. They're asking questions and so forth. And so uh, he started seeing that she was really, really good at this. And even later on, as time went on, um, pastor had crisis in his own life and um his um his wife was having difficulty in childbirth and he contacted this woman that he in his former church and you know and, and she knew how to get a hold of it you know you have those people that are really good at, at, at praying and so forth that's like one of one of, one of their um, one of their abilities and so he was able to uh not just say and this is the important part, and make sure we all, we all catch this. Because sometimes when we're not good at something, we simply say, well, you're not good at this. Just sit back on the sidelines, and we'll get someone who is without really understanding and knowing what that other person is. When you, when you say, well, I want you to sit on, you know, not sit on the sidelines, but you're not good at this, then it's important for us as believers because we love each other, right, to find out what we are good at. To, to pray and to seek God and to say, okay, if you're not real strong in this, I know God has given you gifts. What are you strong in, right? And so, you know, when we do that, you know, it's good because in that way, we show love one to one another because we are, like the word God says, considering other people about ourselves. And this is very important because this is the kind of stuff that this is how people leave churches. Because they'll say, well, you're not good at this. And then they just have them sit and then do nothing else rather than find out what they're good at. And then after a while, they're like, well, I guess I'm not useful around here. And so they wind up walking away. We don't ever want that to happen. But this pastor was wise. 
And then he found out what she was good at. And then he put her to work at what she was good at. And so um, it, it's interesting because when, when he talks about this later on, you know, she had this incredible strength and she also was able to encourage other people. And they had a really strong prayer ministry all because this pastor paid attention, listened, even though he found out what she wasn't good at, he found out what she wasn't good at. And that was really good. So I want to talk to you today about uh, the equipping of the Holy Spirit. And this is really, really important, okay? When, the, when we talk about the, the equipping of the Holy Spirit, here is it's something that, that, that uh, we need to know. First of all, when you're being equipped in the, uh, 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 the Holy Spirit equips you, first of all, the Holy Spirit doesn't give you gifts. The Holy Spirit is the gift. That's real understand, important to understand. So if the Holy Spirit is the gifts, we see a lot of things as time goes on. People say, well, I'm really good at this. I have this gift of, of this in ministry. And then they go ahead and they use this gift and so forth. But then as time goes on, they say, well, I believe God is changing my gift. You know, now I'm good at this. Well, what really is the case is that it's not that God is changing their gift. It's God has changed their mission. They're in, the, in, their, in their ministry. They're now doing another ministry that God wants them to do. And then by doing that, God changes that gift, okay, uh, and the Holy Spirit, so that it matches that ministry that God wants you to do. Remember, everything God wants us to do, he is, and in doing his will, he equips us to do. God is never going to leave us hanging, okay? So, and then we'll, we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. So the church is the body of Christ. We're all in agreement on that, right? Christ adds members to local churches. It's true. That's how y'all came to be here one by one. You know, started a smaller congregation, grew larger and larger. And then I always say, that, you know, people, the reason why people go to church is why? Because they want to see Jesus. That's why it's important that people come and see Jesus. They see Jesus in us. They see Jesus in the church. You know, they see Jesus in the leadership, right? That's important. So each member has the Holy Spirit's active presence in his or her life. The Holy Spirit does not work in people's lives merely for their own personal edification, but so the body of Christ can be built up and strengthened. You know, you may wonder, you know, why are you here now? You are here now because God wants you to be here. You're learning important stuff so you can be a part of the body of Christ, so we can build up and encourage one another, so that you can be empowered to go and do God's will. That's why we're here, okay, uh, in, the, in this place tonight, okay? That is why we need each other. All agreement? We need each other, right? Can't survive without each other. Very good. Without a healthy and functioning body, a church will miss much of what God intends for it. The reason why churches struggle and the reason why, you know, even doors closed and stuff in churches is because they have their own notion of what they think God wants to do. Okay? They have their own way in which they want to reach people. Rather than allowing God to do work through those people. And also another thing is, is a lot of times, and I've seen this many times in, even um, in, in, in my own life, is a lot of times we see certain things and we think that we need to protect the church from certain people. Rather than saying those people need Christ, need to come to God. Instead, we place ourselves as the gatekeeper in the church. And then we look around and we are the filter in which... The people pass through. And if we say, well, I don't know. I know that person. He has a little bit of a reputation or she has a reputation. I don't really think this would be good for the body. So you wind up holding that person back or, you know, or discourage him, whatever, rather than saying, you know what? God can work through anybody. He works through me. You know, he can work through you, right? I mean, we're not a special brand of people that go, like, we're good enough to be Christians. None of us were. Absolutely zilch. Look at it in Romans. It says none of us are good now. And in our little righteousness that we think we have, it's filthy rags. And those aren't true. And you know, and so it's important for us to remember that you know, no one is beyond God's reach. Okay? The only time you're beyond God's reach is when you breathe your last. And then your spirit, you know, your, your soul departs from your body, then it's too late. Then you're off and you know when. But I mean, I'm just saying, I've even heard, you know, stories where God sent people back 
happens, you know, I mean, so, hey, it's totally up to God. Nothing is impossible for God. And it's important that we think that way as well. When members refuse to serve or they leave the church because of broken relationships, number one, re number one reason, if we had like uh, the family feud, right? We were all talking, you know, reasons people leave the church. You'd be like, broken relationships. <laughs> Ding, it would say number one. <laughs> That would be the reason why people leave the church, okay? When, okay, so let me read that again. When members refuse to serve or leave the church because of broken relationships, church members suffer because part of God's provision for them is now missing, okay? We are all the less for it as well, okay? So it's important that we stay focused on those things. We stay focused on what God wants to do. That's why it's important for us to understand and say, okay, God, your will be done, not ours. God may use this body, and then he may say, but I would like you to do it in this method, rather than what we think is good, okay? We want to try our old tried and true methods that we've used years and years ago, and that's a lot of times what we do. And then when you keep banging into a wall all the time, you're just like, that's it, I'm tired. Ministry is no good for me. It's not that. It's you're, you're banging into a wall instead of moving a few steps over and going through the door that God opens. And, and instead of, you know, constantly hitting the wall all the time. And so oh, we, we get stubborn. We're like, but I just know there's a door here. No, there isn't. That's a wall. You've got to keep on going until your head hurts. And when, when we allow God to move through us, that's why it's important to have a surrendered life to Christ. Because Christ needs to be able to move you just like chess pieces on board. You can't say, oh, no, Lord, I'm sorry. I don't move that way. I just go this way. No, the Lord decides, and he moves you. And if you're willing and obedient and say, God, do what you want with me. Okay, God, if you want to do this, I'm open to it. Let, uh, I want your will to be done. Okay? So when that happens, and, and there's a, I believe there's, a, there's an old, uh, old saying, too, which says, it is better to be like a reed in the wind, right? pliable, bendable, rather than rigid as a cedar. You know, cedars don't move, right? I shall, I shall, I shall not be moved. We don't ever want to be that way, okay? So Jesus accomplished his purposes, and then God, you know, uh, then he uses us. That's why trust and obey, but there's no other way. Great song, lots of truth to it. And it's important that we trust and obey the Lord. Because the reason why we don't want to, we're like, well, Lord, if I give you control, you're going to make a mess of things. That's a lot of times that's, what we, that's how we think. And when we do, we hold back things to ourselves. And when we do, then God says, uh, I can't use you then because you only have a percentage of God. It would be like even if someone wanted to, you know, say, well, I really need your help. Okay. I, let's say you have a chore, right? Let's say you know, there's a chore. So, um, I don't know, cleaning out the basement. That sounds good. So, so what happened was, is a friend calls you, you go over and you, 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 uh, you say, I will help you clean out the basement. Although you only get to use my leg. That's it. No other part of me. So whatever the leg can do, then that is what I will do. You clean the basement out. As many of you know, you can't lift very much with just your leg, okay? But that is what we do to God. We say, God, you can have this part because this, this I'm okay with, but the rest I'm going to hold myself. And we can't be those kind of people. Those are the things that we need to surrender to God and say, God, all of me, right? All of me. Take all of me, Lord. So let's, uh, let's, let's continue on. A spiritual gift is a manifestation of God at work through you. That's pretty cool. So when you have a spiritual gift, it's what God wants to do through you. He's giving you that equipment so that you need to do what he tells you to do. God works in and through you to bear spiritual fruit. Your focus should be on God living his life through you to accomplish his purposes. It's really good when you think about it. And so the one thing that uh, when we do things, we like to do, I, we take a spiritual gift inventory. And when we take a gift inventory, I've, I've seen a lot of people that they become rather rigid. They'll say, well, the Lord is, has used me for discerning of spirits. And that's all I do. 
nothing else. Well, when you do that, you're limiting yourself and you're saying, this is it. So the focus is on what? Is it on God or is it on you? It's on you, right? Because you're focused on what you can do. I am a discerner of spirits and nothing else. Lord, if you need any spirits discerned, let me know. Anything else? Mm, not your man. I'm not, I'm not your person. I'm not available. And when we do that, that's where that's where things become closed and difficult. And then we wonder, oh, wow, oh, God isn't using me. You just gave God limitations. You told God you're a discerner of spirits and have nothing else. No, we need to say, Lord, use me however you see fit. And you're like, wow, I laid hands on someone and they got healed. Praise the Lord. A lot of us, when you look at, at, at there, there are gifts in the Bible, we look at certain things and we think some things have more flair, right? I mean, because, you know, we see, you know, people like, you know, but we hear about stories, you know, Smith Wigglesworth, Benny Hinn, all those, you know, people, right? You know, they're going on and they lay hands and people, you know, T.L. Osborne and all these other people, right? And they lay hands on them, you know, and they leap up and yay, and there's a big stack of crashes over here in the corner and everyone, you know, these people getting healed. And then that, that becomes more like almost kind of like a celebrity thing. And we all want that gift, right? We'd love to have that. And you know, and so when you're, you're laying hands on people and there's a big stack of wheelchairs over here and all the people get healed. If the Lord wants to do that, that will happen. But sometimes God has to prepare people before something like that happens, right? And so uh, when, when we see these certain gifts, that's the one we, that we want. And that's the one we seek after. Rather than, you know, you may have, you know, the ministry gift of hospitality. And it's important for people to feel welcome. And you're just like, no, but man, I want to be the guy that raised hands on people. Well, then you just basically chopped off with the Lord and said, no, sorry, I'm not doing that. But if you were to do the hospitality, guess what? People come in, they feel welcome. They feel the love of God. There's much to be said about it. So what we need to do, as important as believers in Christ, is we need to stop putting, um, how, do I, how, do I, how, do I, how do I put this? Not even so much levels, right? But you know, the uh, classes of gifts, they are all important to the Lord because it's all the Holy Spirit working through you, right? It, 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 there's not, a, well, healing is this priority about, you know, uh, some, uh, about prophecy and so forth. No, it doesn't work that way. Instead, you know, you need to say, Lord, however you want, okay? How many have ever seen a Swiss Army knife, right? Those are awesome. Well, you know what? The Lord and the Holy Spirit is like the same way. He wants you to be like a Swiss Army knife. Oh, there's something needs to be cut. Click. Now we can cut it. Oh, this is, oh there's a screw that needs to be tightened up. Now I got a screwdriver. That is what, you know, God has given you everything you need. The cork. The cork. Oh, yeah, the, the cork screw. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, there, there, there was a cork screw on there, but yeah, sometimes I only, I only use that just a few times in my life. <laughs> But yeah, but, but when we when we do that, you know, we we'll just say, well, Lord, I don't want to understand God. Hammer! That's all I'm going to be. No, Lord doesn't want you to be that way. You've got to uh, be more pliable and usable uh, for God. So, focus your attention on hearing God's call to an assignment, which is his invitation for you to join him. Okay? When you adjust your life to him and obey him, the Holy Spirit will work in you enabling you to accomplish what God desires. That is what we want to do. All right? Now, I want to, now, now uh, I, if I may, I want to read to you in scripture, and I, I, wanna, I want to uh, really show you something maybe you've never seen before in the word of God. You see, you have to understand that the, the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ, you know, working through us, able to do all the things that, that Jesus did. So we are able to accomplish the word of God. Okay, we're able to accomplish the will of God. Okay, just like Jesus did. Jesus said, I want to do the will of my father. Well, I want to show you some, some interesting things that, and, and I hope I want you, that you grasp this. We're, we're going to go over this in, in the word of God. I'm in the, the book of John and it says things. I want you to understand first of all, here's Jesus in uh, John chapter 14. He's speaking and here he is talking okay, to the disciples because he's getting ready to say, okay, guys, you're going to pick up where I leave off. Okay, I'm going to be going to the Father soon. And then when I do, you're going to have to 
you know, mind the shop, okay? And then the old words go. So here's how it goes. So he uses words, and I want to show you the significance of these words that Jesus uses. In four, uh, chapter 14, verse 11, he says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. We've heard Jesus speak that a lot, right? You know, I am the Father and one. Okay, that's really, really cool. So he says, so then he, after he says this in 11, he goes and says in 12, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also and even greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Okay? If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, this is, a, this is important. And when Jesus is saying this, he's saying to accomplish the will of God. Right? It's not anything in my name, right? It's mean like, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm just saying, you know, this is, it's just a part of life, right? You know, uh, my car's having some issues. It, uh, praise God, it's still running well. But, you know, I got some rust issues. I'm not going to go down to the Chevrolet dealership and just say, well, Lord, if I in your name, I'm just going to go ahead and take this pickup right here. Hallelujah. And then I'll, and I'll drive off with it. It's not going to happen. You know, what, what he's saying is that to accomplish the will of God. God has a will. I know he's got a purpose. He's going to work something out. Okay, so he says, believe me, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And he's using these specific words. Now, here's something else he uses. And this is, you're going to see this a lot. And when Jesus says this a lot, this says to me that this is very important. He says this in 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay, we well, see it one time. Then Jesus goes and he talks about the role of the Holy Spirit. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper and he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. Okay, and it says in verse 16, he says this, okay, now, and when, when he says this, he goes on to the bottom of that verse. He says, he abides with you and will be in you. Now, if you look at that, he's using the same terminology of, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Okay? Now he's saying to you about the, with the, about the Holy Spirit, he abides with you and will be in you. So he's like, that relationship you see that God and I have, right? You're going to have as well. Now, and it gets even better, folks, okay? So he goes on to say this, okay? Again, he stresses it, okay? In verse 20, I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Now he's starting to give a clue to the disciples that through the Holy Spirit, I am in the Father, and you are in me. Okay, you in me and I in you. He's putting out something that is, that is much different, but he's using the same terminology as believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Okay, so I want you to know that that closeness, that intimacy, that when Jesus was baptized and there was a voice in heaven that spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Okay, you have to understand that that relationship now is available, okay, because through the Holy Spirit. Okay, so, so he's making this point. He who has my commandments keeps them and is the one who loves me. Now, this is important because he's going back to this. What does he say in 15? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, later on in 21, he says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and disclose myself to him. He's going again. If you love me, you keep my commandments. And if you keep my commandments, you love me. And if you love me, you keep my commandments. And if you keep my commandments, you love me. He's really stressing this out, okay? Stressing this point, I should say, okay? So then, interesting thing is, so when, 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 when Jesus is, is, is talking to his disciples, okay? He, lets, he, he makes it very, very clear, okay? He says again, all right? In, in 21, he said it. Now in 23, he says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He is saying that, you know, you, you want to live a life that's pleasing to God, and again, that relationship that I have with the father, you're going to have too. Okay, so Jesus is making this very, very clear. And then he even goes and says it 
in a different way. He says, he who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. So he's making this very, very clear over and over again, okay? He talks in verse 26, the Holy Spirit, the helper, uh, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring remembrance of all that I said to you, okay? Then he drops down, okay, in, in verse 31, do exactly as the Father ha hath commanded me. Jesus says, uh, what I do, I hear the Father speaking to me, what the Father says, that is what I do. So in chapter 15, on, in verse 7, Jesus says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. You ask, right? Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. He's repeating again. He's letting disciples know this is important stuff, okay? But what are the conditions, okay? There's a, there is a condition to all this. From, where, from what you're reading and what you're hearing in the word of God, what is one of the conditions? Very good. What's another one? Very good. What are you saying, right? If you love me, you keep my commandments. I, he keeps saying this. He said it now quite a few times. Okay, so this is one of the conditions of living a life like this. Okay, and doing the Father's will. And then, so then he says again. Okay, in verse eight, my Father is glorified by this. This is what thrills God. Okay, so he's seeing this. Okay, my Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have loved you, abide in my love. We're seeing a lot in the, in the word of God here. You see a lot that Jesus is talking about in you, in you, in you. Now we got abide, okay? In you, there's a dwelling, there's in you that, that the spirit is gonna come. See, before Jesus is speaking to his disciples and it's flesh and bone that are keeping them separated, Jesus can't be inside every one of those disciples. But Jesus is explaining to them that this wonderful fellowship that we have now, that we're going to have it, it's going to be even better because I'm going to be in you. Okay, and then the Father is in me, I'm going to be in you, and you know, and then and, you know, we're, 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 going to be, we're going to be together. And so he says these things, and he, as he lays this down, what's really, what's really great is this, okay? So he says this, okay? Again, Verse 10, chapter 15, if you will keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. He is giving you the conditions of abiding. It's what? Follow God, obey his commands, right? That's what he's saying. If you love, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, as I have kept my father's love. So he's taking a step. He said, you do this, abide in me, do this, you know, you, you, you follow uh, my commandments. If you love me, you're going to, you are going to do what the father, you know, what, what, uh, what my commandments are. Okay. So then in verse 12, he says of, of chapter 15, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. It's more and more. It's like, it's like when, when you're taking uh, the, uh, the veil off of something, he's revealing more and more as he goes on. And he says this. Okay, then he goes down and he says in verse 14, he says this, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Here's another command. You know what he's like, if he, he says this, if, if you love me, you'll do what I command. And then he says this, and then he goes and he says, you are my friends if you do what I command. Okay, and then he says, okay, he says again in 16, of uh, verse 16 of chapter 15, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you will go bear fruit, that your fruit will remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. He said this three times now, okay? That you know, you will have it, you will do what, what to do God's will, right? And whatever you have, he will, he, I, you know, he will give to you. Then he also punctuates that with, this is my command that you love one another. So he's going again, he's saying about this command and saying how important it is. Now, he's already talked about uh, commands and if you love me, you'll do what I command. And he's setting it all up, okay? Jesus is setting it all up. And then he lays the command on him. If you love me, you know, then you'll do what I command. Oh, and by the way, the command, love one another as I love you. 
See, Jesus is preparing the road for this. He's getting the disciples ready. That is why, church, it is so significant and important that we love each other the way Christ loved us. Because if we don't, you're not going to get through that wall people have up. You're not going to be able to show God's love. Because, you know, everyone says, hey, dog eat dog. You know, I'm living for myself today. God forbid that the church be like that. All right? Amen? All right. So as, as we move on then, Jesus says, okay, he's talking about when the helper comes, and you know, whom I will send to you, the Father, that is the spirit of truth, who, uh, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. Okay? And then he says, and you will testify also. So he's, he's laying out the groundwork on this. Okay, then in chapter 16, he talks again about the Holy Spirit. And he says, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Okay, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will no longer see me. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Okay, then he says this in verse 13. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own initiative, but what he hears, that he will speak. Again, he's reflecting back. Remember, what did, what did Jesus say, right? I don't act on my own, but whatever the Father tells me. Here he's saying again, Jesus is saying, that intimate relationship that I have is going to be yours, okay? And he talks again, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. He will not speak on his own, but what he hears, he will speak and disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and disclose it to you. All things that, that, the Father, uh, that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and discloses it to you. Okay? Are you understanding a little bit more then? When you're being equipped, when you, when you look and you see the work of Jesus, we, we somehow we look at that and we go, wow. That was really great. I don't think that that's possible for today. No, it is possible for today because of through the Holy Spirit that you have all what was disclosed to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, what the Father disclosed, disclosed to me, I'm disclosing it to you. See, many times we get this idea that when God wants us to do something, okay, we get this idea that here, okay, here's the disciples, right? Here's the people, okay? So, so Jesus goes to heaven, right? Boom, off he goes. There's a cloud, it floats away out of their sight. All them are staring, they're staring, staring, staring. And then the angels are like, what are you staring for? You know, don't worry about it. You know, when Jesus is going to come back, and when he does, he's going to come back in, 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 the, in the same fashion. Now, you know, go out, do stuff, right? That's what he's telling them. Go, basically, Jesus told you everything he needs to do, he wants you to do, now go do it. Okay, well, we get this idea that from that point on, right? Here's the disciples. Okay, Jesus wants us to do something. Okay, well, I'm gonna get a rock. We're gonna come on, we're gonna build a church, guys. Let's look for some sticks. Let's get some rocks. See what we got around here. See if we can come up with some tools. And I'll go down to the local lumber store and we'll see if we can get some hardware and put together a church. You know, and, and, and that's how we have this opinion that there is that 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 what happened with Jesus is stronger and that doesn't exist today. Today we have just a shadow of actually what it was, what, what, what you said. And then you know, I couldn't tell you folks, that is not, that can't be further from the truth. Okay, I want you to picture this, okay? I know I was trying to think of, you know, who I want to say. Uh, whether you like him or not, I'm just gonna use him as an example, okay? Elon Musk, okay? So let's say Elon Musk says, I'm gonna go on a trip. And I'm going to travel over and I'm going to go do some technical work and, you know, sell some Tesla cars or whatever, right? Over in another country, okay? Let's say he goes, it's, uh, he goes to Africa, okay? So he's going to go to Africa. So then what he does is he asks you, right? Walter, you know, he says, I want you to watch my corporation while I'm gone, all right? So right away, what comes to mind? It comes to mind is this, Walter, the next day, Walter, you know, he goes and he, he, whatever, you know, clothes Walter has, he puts them on, you know, and he does his best. And he drives his car or walks or whatever, goes to the Elon Musk place, and he's like, hey, how you doing? And they're all like, oh, you're here to watch the store for Elon Musk. Well, we've got a little place that we've kind of cleared out in a nook. 
down in the basement for you. So why don't you go down there and then we'll give you some of Elon's paperwork that he wants you to do while he's gone. But this is how we vision the church without when, when Jesus goes to heaven. Instead, folks, I want to point, paint a different picture for you. And that is this. Imagine a wardrobe person shows up to Walter's house and says, these are Elon Musk suits. I made them to fit you. Okay, now, so now Walter puts on the nice suit, right? You know, so he looks like the billionaire, okay? Then Walter drives Elon Musk's car to work. And when he goes there, he comes in there and he walks into the corporation. All the people are standing there going, hey, Walter, they're treating him like the CEO, right? By then, like what well, Elon Musk is. And Walter goes and sets in Elon Musk's office. And he uses his stuff. And he does everything he needs to do. And he has everything at his fingertips. And people are ready to jump to, you know, Walter wants a donut. He's got it, okay? Right? You know, and a, and a cup of coffee too, right? Even if they got to go all the way, you know, to Fort Francis and get it from Tim Hortons, by golly, they'll do it. And, you know, and they, they bring it to me. And, and then, folks, that is what Jesus has done for us. We're not starting over at the beginning. We're going, well, gee, I don't know how we're going to manage this. No, God has given us everything we need to do the ministry and to be able to do the will of God that he's called us to do. So if we have this and we know we have this, right? And this, I'm not talking anything new. This is right out of the word of God. You looked at what we said. That we, that we just read in there that what the Father has, I will have and I will disclose it to you. Jesus is saying that, hey, you use my office. You drive my car. You wear my clothes. You are going to pick up where I left off. Okay? With all the goodies. And let's not also forget the bank account, right? Exactly. Walter is going to have to get some stuff done. Walter's going to need access. Walter has the key codes to all the banks that Elon Musk has so he can do the business that he's supposed to do. See, but we get this idea before that it's like, well, you know, Jesus, he kind of left us shorthanded. Well, we just got to come up with it on our own, and then God will give us the secondhand thing that come on down. Now we have the Holy Spirit. We're able to accomplish those things. That's why it's important. When you are in the will of God and you understand, I believe, personally myself, I believe that there is no other, uh, because this is what Jesus did, and I, I believe we do the same thing. And that there is no other effective way to minister to people who are lost than if someone has cancer, lay hands on them and they're healed. Okay? Someone's demon possessed in the name of Jesus and the demons leave. These are the things, folks. These are the, these are the things God has given us. If you see it done in, okay, that Jesus did, okay? When I say that, the works that Jesus did, we can do them too. But we cut ourselves short. Because for some reason, we think that it's more holy if we suffer. And we go, well, uh, we'll I'll just have to make the best of it. We'll rub two sticks together until we get a fire. You don't know. God's like, why do you have to do that? Here, use my lighter. Big flame comes out. Right? I mean, exactly. It's already there. But we, we just, we cut ourselves so short. And folks, I think this is what the Lord wants us to understand, that when a move of God comes, okay, that we need to be equipped and ready. And the way you do that is to say, Lord, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because, Lord, you've already done it. You've already shown the way on how to do it. I just need to follow it in that path. And, and stop thinking I got to reinvent the wheel. We don't. We don't. We just do it. All we got to do is just do the things Jesus did. Okay, you know what I mean? Hey, and I kid you not, and, and by all no means, I mean, if, you know, if, if there's a lady that comes and she's weeping and she comes to you and she says, my daughter is dead, and you walk into that building and uh, uh, into a room and you're like, well, she's just sleeping, you know, and you, and, it's, and of course, you know, it's God's will, right? You lay hands on her and she jumps up. Okay, give her something to eat. I'm just saying that what is it that, that Jesus said all things, you know? He didn't say everything except raise the dead. Can't do that. No, no. No, he never said that. And folks, here's the thing. Let me, if I may, let me seal this in and just show you how awesome this really is. Okay, I do. I, I want to show you that this as well. It, 
He goes on and, and Jesus uh, speaks about this and he starts to pray, right? He prays, hey, Father, you know, I am you, you're in me, right? And he gets all this, this, uh, all, all this uh, uh, laid out. And then he talks, he prays to the disciples, okay? So when he gets to that prayer, this is where we think, yeah, Jesus prayed for the disciples, but not us. Well, folks, if you keep on reading, I want you to understand something here too, okay? I want you to, I'm going to read this with you. Okay, and we're gonna, we're gonna go over this. And this is in uh, John chapter 17, verse 20. Listen very carefully. I do not ask on behalf of these alone. I'm about the disciples, okay? Not just the 12, Lord, that you've given me. Well, minus Judas. Or no, wait, Judas hasn't betrayed me yet, I don't think. And maybe, I don't know. But anyway, but he's, uh, so, okay, he says, uh, you know, uh, it's not just for the disciples alone. All right, he says this, now listen, I do not ask on behalf of those alone, of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Guess what? Jesus just prayed for you. Jesus just prayed for you, okay? Listen very carefully as we go on 22. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, not to our disciples, you, okay? That they may be in one, just as we are in one. I in them, you in me, there's that wording again, right? And, you know, and that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, okay, that's the that's disciple, that's outside the disciples, right? They also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. So when Jesus is saying that, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, that 12 that's standing there, with him that are, that are sitting here listening to his words, but for those who will believe in me through the word, okay? So when Jesus prayed that, folks, he, that is the son of God praying for us. He's praying for you, okay? At that moment, he's praying for Paul. He's praying for Clement. He's praying, uh, Clement of Rome. He's praying, praying for Cornelius, the centurion. He's praying for Aquila and Priscilla. Okay, he's praying for Apollos. He's praying for John Wycliffe. He's praying for John Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, D.L. Moody, Charles Spurgeon, William Seymour, Billy Graham, K. Arthur, and you. Do you understand that? Here's Jesus saying all these things right then and there. He's praying for you. And he says this, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for Faye Edwards, who will believe in me through the word. Okay? Jesus is praying for you. Okay? And you know, when you, when you see that, folks, that is why I, I, I want you to understand this negates the argument that miracles are not for today. This negates, this cancels out the argument that, oh, it was only for the disciples, but not for us. Here, folks, as I just showed you, Jesus already prayed for you. He's already prayed for you. And he wants, you know, he says, Lord, let, let, let it be, God. Let them do my will also. And that's the beautiful thing, folks. And that's why, again, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to pick up where Jesus left off. We need to say, Lord God, show us. And then we, we pay attention, right? And we say, Lord God, we want to do your will. And then we, we just find out where God is working. And then when we see God is working, we join him. And then he equips us through the Holy Spirit. And that's why we're, we're, we're doing this class, because I believe it's coming. I believe it's coming. I believe that that, that, that that time is coming. We are going to do what it said in John 14, 12. We're going to work miracles in Jesus' name. Why? Because we have the sanction to do it. God has given us the authority to do it. Just like I give the illustration with Elon Musk, you can wear his clothes, drive his car, and spend his money. 
I mean, that is the only thing I can tell you. But you're not going to do it frivolously, obviously. You can spend it on yourself. Poor Elon Musk won't get the business done. But you can do what he wants, what he asks you to do. Okay? And then that's the thing, folks. And so when we, when we do that, we have to understand then that, you know, God has already equipped us for it. So why, why do we cower? Why do we think that we got to start over the beginning? We don't. We just need to say, Jesus, where are you working? God, we can do it. And Lord, if you want us to do it, it's done. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and the thing is, is, you know, that's why it's important for us. Pastor has, you know, that's why. We come on Sunday, folks. Okay? The first thing we do over business is to pray. Why? Get the junk out of the way that we gathered all week long. Okay? Shouldn't be that way, but it does happen. And so that's why it's important now. Because why? Because then you can't hear what God wants to say to you. God speaks to you and speaks to us as a congregation. The Lord may be giving you words. He wants you to go say to someone to encourage them. And, you know, and, and, and by folks, I'm guilty as all, just as, as y'all are, just then. Nothing riles up my feathers more than politics. Are you there with me? Can you say amen? <laughs> You see the world going to Hades in a handbasket and figure, I gotta do something to stop it. And my wife always tells me, well, that ain't the way to do it. Well, you know, by, by putting a little quip or some kind of comment in Facebook, you know, I'm like, well, someone's gotta say something about common sense. But you know, folks, we need to, that's why we gotta, we gotta, you know, we gotta, when we come before the Lord, we gotta make sure that the junk is out of the way so we can hear what God wants us to do. Okay, because God wants to speak to you, wants to speak to the body, all of us together, the leaders, okay, and God wants to say, man, move forward with me, and God says, here's where I'm going, this is what's going to happen and stuff, that's why we encourage one another, and we say, we can do this, we can do this, hey, Jesus didn't do it alone, he needed 12, right, amen, exactly, you know what, we all can do the same thing too, we just have to say, Lord, your will be done in all things. Be glorified. Be glorified. And have that heart. Say, God, to glorify your name. Glorify your name. That is what Jesus said when he was talking. Father, be glorified. Father, be glorified. And he responded. In that one, when, he, when, that, when that happened, after the transfiguration, he responded and said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it. Folks, it's the same thing with you. When you speak, and you have the Holy Spirit in you, and you speak, to, to God the Father, you have that access through Jesus Christ. And you know, and then God responds to you and, and he says, you know, I have glorified it, I will glorify it. Okay? And then, and that's the thing that we are not shorthanded. We get the, like, like you know, we don't have our hands being tied behind our back. Oh, trying to minister as best as I can, but I'm all bound up here, you know? No. You know, I, 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 you're like, well, you know, I would love to be able to do God's work, but you know, I just have a bank account. I got five bucks in my account. Well, okay, you know. No, it, it's not that way. That's not how the church operates. God didn't just say, well, I left you five bucks. God bless you all. Hey, why don't you go ahead and take that talent and go double it somewhere? No. You know, when he's talking about that, he's talking about, you know, we don't want us to just sit on our blessed assurance, right? And then just sit there and go, I'm saved. To blazes with everybody else. That's not what God wants us to do. God wants us to say, I'm saved. I'm going to try to take as many people as I can with me. Okay, in the name of Jesus, before I go back, before we go to heaven. And that's what we need to do. And that's why, folks, you, you can see clearly in Scripture, it's all outlined. There's conditions. What are the conditions? Love God. Love God. Yeah, very, yeah, exactly, right? Love God, you know, naturally, you know, can be saved, believe in Jesus Christ, right? Then the, the second one is what? Oh, if you love God, what does he say? You obey my commandments. And then what is one of those commandments? How we love one another as Christ loved us. And that is a tall order, folks. Jesus did a lot for us. But I, don't, I can tell you physically, I don't think I can love somebody that way. But I know Jesus can through me. Hallelujah. All right. Praise God. Well, uh, I'm going to uh, go with the, this last thing, folks. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, I want to encourage you, first of all, okay? There is one thing the enemy loves to play games with. And that is our minds. If you have been seeking the Holy Spirit, but you have not received it, the enemy just goes to say, hey, you can't get it. Hogwash. You, uh, the thing is, sometimes 
When you want something really bad, the Lord wants to see you pursue it. So if you are seeking the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you to keep on seeking. Don't stop. When I received it, um, I was uh, 16 years old. And the first time uh, there was this uh, rally, you might say, right at our church, a guy by the name of Ken Krivolovic, and he had his, his ministry was impartation of the Holy Spirit. That was what he did. So he talked about the Holy Spirit, how important it was that we all have him in our life. And then he would, you know, pray for people and whatnot. Well, and, and, and he would, you know, reveal truths and stuff like that, the Holy Spirit. And um, he's a uh, son of God. Okay, so first time we went there, my brother and I went there, my brother got it. Man, he went up there and it was just like, Lord, you know, God, I mean, he laid hands, like, boom, 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 you know, tongue. When it was me, I felt like I was like a wet blanket or something, you know? It was like, nothing. Nothing, nothing. He you know, and I was like, I didn't get anything. What's up? So it, it, it how can I say? It? it bugged me, and I was brooding on it all night long. And I was like, and I was just like, well, I'm going tomorrow. And by golly, as soon as he even gets those words out of his mouth, I'm charging up at the beginning, and I'll be like, I'm going all the way to the front of the altar, and I'm gonna be like, I want it. <laughs> give, give, give. Okay, folks. Let me give you a good example, okay? How many times have you seen where, uh, for instance, an Apple, we're going to be uh, giving out an Apple iPad or, right, or iPod, what, well, iPad, and then you saw how the lines, and some people were in lines for days waiting for that iPad, just waiting for that Apple store to open so they could go get that iPad, right? And then they, it didn't matter what price it was, they're just ready to leap in there and get it. Huge line of people. Folks, why can't we hunger after the Holy Spirit now? Okay, where you can sit there, you know, I mean, that would be interesting, right? Pastor comes to the, to the church or whatever, and here's a line of people waiting to get in. I want to go to the Holy Spirit. That would be awesome. But anyway, but, you know, but I'm just using that as an illustration, okay, about, you know, how much when we really, really want something. Okay, when we're, all in, when we're in a, um, you remember the old telephone contest? The hundred scholar receive it. How many times did you die? <laughs> Give me those tickets, <laughs> Right? So anyway, uh, so the following day I went and pastor said, who oh, wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Man, beeline. I was right there, whatever. And you know what? The, uh, the, 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 uh, that minister came for a while. He, he, uh, he, he chuckles and he says, the Lord told me that you were coming. And he said this, you're like a kid in a candy store and you will not be disappointed. And then boom, laid me right out, right? I mean, I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and it was awesome. And I was said, then afterwards, he, he, uh, uh, he prayed with me and said, the Lord also wants you to know you, uh, that he wants to call you full-time in the ministry. So I got my calling in the ministry at that time, too. And so, yeah, and he said, you know, you're going to bring many people to repentance and so forth. He said, God's got his eye on you, you know. And so, folks, those, that can happen, you know. But I will say this. There are other people, like, uh, for instance, um, uh, my mom went to a, a conference, and, and she she got filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And she used to speak in tongues and everything. Well, she thought she had to have her eyes closed all the time. She opens her eyes, she won't be able to speak anymore. So she sits there, and she opens up one eye, and she's still speaking, and then she opens up the other one, and she's still speaking. You know, it, 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 it doesn't work that way, right? I, you can turn it off and turn it on, just like a switch. You know, when the, when the Lord gives that to you, that you have. And some people, they manifest in different ways. My wife speaks a, a little bit in tongues, but her ministry, when she does, is it, it's in the piano. She can really, really minister and stuff. And the Holy Spirit uses her that way. Um, and then also, there are people that are like, uh, you know, that are like faith, where you know, one touches them, and they, they, uh, then they're at home by themselves, and then all of a sudden, they want it, you know, and they pray, and all say, boom, it happens, right? It doesn't have to be a certain way. However, we're, we're, the only reason why I say the laying on hands is because when you look in the word of God, that does seem to be the more general thing, right? Because even Simon the sorcerer said, you know, to, to Peter and stuff, right? Give me this power so when I lay hands on people that they will receive the Holy Spirit. So it is by that, that is what I go by. Okay, and when, and when um, Simon the Tanner came into the house of Cornelius, 
you know, lay hands on them. That's what it says. So, and so that, that's why we do what we do. But it doesn't mean that that is the absolute. God will not fill you unless you do that. No, you, you, God can fill you however he decides. But I'm just saying that's going to be the usual. You can say, I'd really like to receive the Holy Spirit. Just know that I'm going to be. That's what, the, that's what the word of God says. Praise God. So I want to encourage you, keep seeking. Don't stop. And if anyone ever talks to you and says, well, I went up, you know, and, um, we had a special day, and I went up, and I didn't get nothing. Keep seeking. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Because they know what? If it's worth having, it's worth fighting for. It's worth seeking. Amen? Amen. And I got news for you. It is. It's like God charging, hooking battery cables up to your life, man. <laughs> charging you up. Out of really. your belly shall flow rivers. Amen. Living water. Amen. It's not Amen. coming from your mind. It's out of your belly. Yep. It flows. And then you've got to love your emotions and everything. Yeah. Exactly. All right. But praise God. So, um, a couple of uh, all right. A couple of quick questions here is this: Reflect on your experiences with God. Can you identify times when God was at work around you? And you knew it. What was, uh, what was the time when God was working around you in a situation, but you didn't recognize God's activity at the time? Okay. And then, have you recently been nasty in, or be involved in a ministry for which you felt inadequate? Could it be that God is inviting you to a new level of ministry with him that he will equip you? And then also, has your service for God in the past been centered more on you, what you felt comfortable doing, rather than on listening to God's voice and doing whatever he asked? How might your service for God be more God-centered in the future? Something to think about. All right. And I want to encourage you, you know, and in your time of prayer, um, this coming Sunday night, we are going to have we are, are, are going to talk about repentance and renewal, but even, uh, even more, more than that, we are going to have a time of breakup. Yes, you're going to come and you're going to divorce your old nature. You're going to say, old nature, old way of doing things, that's it. I'm putting it in the ground. We're breaking up. This just ain't working out for me. This is not the relationship I want. And so that's what we're doing. I even, I even wrote a breakup song. So we're going to sing a breakup song too. <laughs> yep. Hit the bricks, old nature. Yeah. You really did me wrong. Sayonara, adios. So long. Now get yourself gone. <laughs> All right. Praise God. So I want to encourage you guys to uh, come and if you know someone to that, if you're struggling and stuff like that, you know, say, you know, as a believer, say, you know what? You need to break up with your old nature. And just say, this ain't working, man. Hit the road. Well, uh, you and me, nah, we're through. We're done. All the good times we had, it's nailed to the cross. Because now, old nature, it's over. We're moving on in Christ. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your goodness. And Lord God, that your word is just phenomenal. And God, it, it, it illuminates those things that we need to have and what we need to do in our life so that we are not ineffective. And so I pray, Lord God, that we will all reflect. And Lord, I, even, I speak for myself, Lord, here. God, if there ever was a time where I stood in your way of your will, and if I ever said, no, no, Lord, this is the way it has to be, I ask you to forgive me, Lord. I repent of that, God, because I do not want to be in your way. I do not want to be the one that obstructs the hand of God. And so, Lord, I just ask, Lord Jesus, that you will purify me, Purge me, cleanse me, oh God, so that, Lord, I don't have that kind of stinking thinking, Lord. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will, uh, Lord, just work through all of us, Lord God, and reveal that to us, Lord, that in uh, through your spirit, God, those wonderful things that you want us to know, Lord, and, and give us that revelation and vision, Lord God, of us working with you and what we can accomplish through you, Lord, through the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord God, that you help us to get excited about those things, God. Because, Lord, that is, is what we need. We need a transformation. We need you in our lives. We need you directing everything that we do and say. And we pray, Lord God, that it would be for your glory. And, Lord, just as you said in your word, Lord, 
Help us to realize that the authority and the power that you have given us in the name of Jesus, that authority and power that you've given us through the Holy Spirit, Lord God, that, Lord, that we can do the things you did, Lord God. And, Lord God, we can speak, Lord, the, the things that, that you said, Lord. And, God, and to do your will, Lord, we can accomplish it. Lord, nothing is impossible for you. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. We ask, Lord, that as we go from this place, God, that you will lead, guide us, protect us, bring us again safely back. We love you, Lord. We love your word, God. And we just pray, Lord, that you will help us to love each other as Christ loved us. In your holy name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Hallelujah. God is good. All the time. Thank you. All right. Thank you for everyone for joining us. God bless y'all.